working. There we go. Okay, so uh, um, as it will say on your screen, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, the chat does not show up in the recording, however, um, but again, if you would like to ask any questions, you can do so either in the chat box, or if you would rather make your question anonymous, you can do that through our Q&A function. There's a little checkbox that you can check to say, I would like to be anonymous. So uh, my name is Heather Bobrowitz. I am the uh, programming librarian here at uh, STC Library. And uh, earlier this year, Dr. St. Pierre reached out and contacted me because he wanted to get a speaker for the medical and health services management students. Um, so this is geared towards uh, that program. However, everyone here <laughs> is definitely welcome to be here. You are welcome to interact and to ask questions. Um, and I know our speaker uh, is uh, a very uh, um, uh, a very knowledgeable woman who will be able to uh, answer a lot of your questions about uh, this topic. So uh, let me introduce you to our speaker. This is Dr. Patty McCoy. She's an adjunct professor, professor and healthcare marketing professional. Drawing on her 35 combined years of experience in the military and healthcare industry, she presents teleseminars and workshops on health services management, value based care, and emerging healthcare marketing technologies. Dr. McCoy earned a Bachelor of Science with a major in speech language pathology from Texas Women's University, a Master of Arts in Management from Webster University, and a Doctor of Business Administration in Marketing from Walden University. She has professional certifications from Six Sigma Dallas, Smith College, and Adjunct World. Dr. McCoy is also a member of the American College of Healthcare Executives, a Chief Marketing Officer Council, and the American Marketing Association. She is an asset to the committees and boards she sits on because she is unafraid to challenge conventional thinking. Dr. McCoy serves as president of the Nonprofit Organizations Association of the United States Army, North Texas, Audi Murphy Chapter, and Walden University's Student Veteran Association. Dr. McCoy lives in Dallas with her husband, and she enjoys running, reading mystery novels, and playing the flute in her uh, free time. So, oh, you are also a Walden, Dr. Uh, St. Pierre. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> so with that, I am going to disappear for a little bit and uh, hand everything over to Dr. McCoy. Thank you so much, Heather. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for coming this afternoon. I have a little bit of frog in my throat. I have some allergies going on up here in Dallas, Texas. So <clears throat> please forgive me. And I may have to take a break every once in a while to drink some water. But welcome to today's presentation where we're going to delve into the exciting and the ever evolving world of health services management, exploring its significance, the pathways to a career in this field and how it shapes the healthcare landscape. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this session will actually explore the dynamic field of health services management, focusing on its evolution, its technological advancements, regulatory changes, opportunities and challenges and how to prepare for a career in this field. Next slide. Next slide, please. So reflecting on how health services management came about, <clears throat> in the early 1900s, health services management began to take shape with the growth of hospitals and the need for someone to actually coordinate and manage healthcare services. In the 30s and 40s, the American College of Hospital Administrators, which is also known as the American College of Healthcare Executives today, was established. And it marked a significant step towards professionalizing health services management. Then in the 70s, the focus shifted from merely managing hospitals to managing systems of care with the introduction of health maintenance organizations, HMOs. 
and other managed care models. Next slide. So you'll see that there's some key milestones that have actually shaped the field of health services management. They've influenced the roles and the responsibilities of health services managers, the technologies that they use, and the strategies that they employ to deliver high quality patient care. So I wanna walk through these milestones shortly with you. So in 33, the establishment of the American College of Hospital Administrators, this actually marked the professionalism, professionalization, excuse me, of health services management. It set the standards and the guidelines for effective management in healthcare settings. Then in 65, these government-run programs significantly increased access to healthcare for millions of Americans and consequently the demand for efficient health services management. In the 80s, you'll see that we had the advent of diagnosis-related groups, DRGs. The in introduction of DRGs transform the way that hospitals are reimbursed for their services from a fee for service model to a fixed rate per case model. This emphasized the need for efficiency and quality and care of health services ma management. Now, in, from the 1900s to the 2000s, we had the rise of health information technology, the adoption of electronic health records, you may have heard them referred to also as electronic medical records, EMRs, EHRs. We also had telehealth services and other digital technologies that actually revolutionized health services management from improving the efficiency, coordination, and the quality of patient care. Then in 2010, we had the passing of the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare. This law actually brought about significant changes in the US healthcare system, including the expansion of insurance coverage and the emphasis of value-based care. Now, health service managers have had to adapt to these changes and find ways to deliver high quality care while reducing costs. And now as we sit here today, we're in the COVID-19 pandemic era, so to speak. The global healthcare crisis has accelerated the adoption of telehealth services and highlighted the importance and the adaptability of responsive health services management. It has also emphasized the need for effective communication and collaboration among healthcare professionals. So as we go on to the next slide, these six milestones that I just covered, will they're significant but they're not at the end of the health services management journey. As we move forward, we stand at the precipice of a new era that's defined by technological advancements. And the healthcare industry has undergone significant technological changes, transforming the way that care is delivered and the way that it's managed. On the next slide, you're going to talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about electronic health records or EMRs. One of the key advancements is the implementation of EHRs. And to understand, it's a digital version of patients' paper charts. They contain the patient's medical history, the diagnosis, the medications, the treatment plans, immunization dates, allergies, radiology images, and laboratory results. There's several benefits of EHRs, and you may know these, but just to kind of review them. They've improved the access to patient data. They lead to more informed decision-making. With the enhanced coordination of care among healthcare providers, we also see an increased patient participation through access to personal records and a reduced healthcare cost due to increased paperwork. And we see the improved safety, We've reduced duplication of testing and improved health. Next slide. So another advancement as it relates to technology is telehealth. And it's referred to as telemedicine as well. And 
it's about it's about distributing health related services and information via electronic information and telecommunication technology. Wow, that's a mouthful. And in a nutshell, it actually allows long distance patient and clinician contact. It allows the care, advice reminders, education, intervention, monitoring, and remote admission. It is an access to care, particularly in rural areas or underserved areas, and it can actually improve the efficiency of care. Studies have shown that. It reduces the cost of care and increases patient satisfaction. Next, please. So the last but not least is the technological advancements of artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are buzz buzzwords in the healthcare industry as well as other industries. Now taking a few minutes to just talk about AI and machine learning, they're used increasingly now in health services management to actually predict patient outcomes, automate routine tasks, and personalize patient care. AI can actually analyze large amounts of data to identify patterns and trends that the human I may not be able to detect. It actually leads to more accurate testing and diagnosis. Now, when you talk about machine learning algorithms, what we know about that is you can learn and make database decisions, improving without being explicitly programmed. Well, what does that mean? So they're used to actually streamline algorithms, improve patient care, and make sense of data sets. In diagnostics, machine learning algorithms can actually analyze medical reports and images for better and faster diagnosis. For example, these algorithms can actually detect anomalies in radiology images that the human eye cannot detect. For example, a machine learning device is known by, it's known inner eye by Microsoft, it's a 3D radiological imaging machine. So we've talked a little bit about technology. Now in the next slide, I wanna talk about regulatory changes. So with regulatory changes, both federal and state laws are heavily regulating the healthcare sector. These regulations, they're designed to protect patients, ensure the quality of care, and promote fairness in the healthcare system. Over time, these regulations have evolved to res in response to changes in the healthcare landscape, such as advances in medical technology, shifts in health insurance market, and changing patient demographics. So let's look further into regulatory changes. Next slide. In 2010, 50 million people did not have insurance. Then they had the Affordable Care Act come, come to play, which is known as Obamacare. It was signed into law in 2010, and it now represents one of the most significant regulatory changes in U.S. healthcare. The ACA has expanded health insurance coverage to millions of uninsured Americans through a combination of subsidies, Medicaid expansion, and health insurance marketplaces. It has also implemented a number of reforms aimed at improving the quality of care and reducing healthcare costs, such as requiring insurance companies to cover preventive services and prohibiting them from denying coverage based on pre-existing conditions. Health service managers have had to adapt to these changes and find ways to deliver high quality care while complying with these new regulations. Next slide, please. So we always will start hearing about compliance. How does one make sure that the regulations are followed? Well, what is compliance? Well, in a nutshell, in compliance in healthcare refers to the process of adhering to legal and to ethical and professional standards applicable to particular healthcare organizations. Federal and state laws, professional organizations, and accrediting bodies may set these standards. 
They cover many areas, including patient privacy, which could be HIPAA and confidentiality, billing and coding, infection control, work safe, workplace safety, which is known as OSHA, and more. Noncompliance can result in penalties such as fines, loss or accreditation, loss of accreditation, excuse me, and even criminal charges that can be brought upon an individual and even hospital. So we spent some considerable time discussing the health service compliance requirements and regulations like HIPAA and the Affordable Care Act and OSHA. But we've also discussed the importance of these requirements and in maintaining the quality of care, protecting the patient's rights and ensuring workplace safety. So you might wonder who ensures these compliance requirements are met? Who oversees these complex and critical operations within a health organization? This is the role of the health services management, and it's one of the many roles. Next slide. So where does this health services manager fit in? They play a critical role, as I mentioned earlier, in ensuring that the organizations comply with relevant regulatory measures. They have to stay informed about current and upcoming changes. They have to assess the impact of these changes on organizations, and they need to really implement strategies to ensure compliance. So this may include developing and enforcing policies and procedures, providing to, you know, even including training the staff, conducting internal audits and inspections, addressing any compliance issues that arise. And in this way, health service managers help protect patients, staff, and the organization from harm. So we've explored some of the traditional roles. I've talked very high level of the high of the health services manager, but you have to look at how they plan, how they direct and coordinate medical and health services. We have seen how they ensure their organizations run smoothly, comply with healthcare laws and regulations, and meet quality standards. But as all, as all of you really know, the field of healthcare, it's not, it's not static. It's always evolving. And a lot of that is due to the technological advancement, to the patient expectations and the new healthcare policies that occur. So these changes are transforming the way that healthcare is delivered and the roles that are within the health services management landscape. So as we transform into the next part of this lecture, I want to delve into these emerging roles more. Next slide. So technological advancements are reshaping, as I mentioned, the healthcare industry. They're creating new roles in health services management. And these roles include the health informatics specialist, the telemedicine coordinator, the AI, the machine learning specialist, the digital health manager, the population health manager, and sustainability manager in healthcare. So let's take a look at each one of these roles. Next slide. Health informatics specialist, for example, uses technology to optimize healthcare delivery. Well, what does that mean? It's basically that they are responsible for managing the ER system, the EHR system, the electronic health record. They have to make sure that the system that's employed by the hospital is easy to use for the physician and also the care team. They're focused at making sure that it meets the regulatory requirements. They have to ensure that the data integrity and security across all the technology in the hospital is related that relates to the patient is sound. It is important for them to really have hands-on with the electronic health record, know all the ins and outs about it, so that they can train and support the staff. They collaborate very closely with the IT department. They analyze and report data they actually create dashboards to support decision-making. 
And in some hospitals and clinics, they oversee the implementation of sharing patient data. Now, the AI and the machine learning specialists, they fo their focus is really on predictive analytics. And what that means is that they really work on a robotic process of information, such as automating appointment scheduling. In other words, if the patient calls and wants an appointment, what is it that they're going to push? Number one or number two? That's the basics of what an AI machine learning specialist does. It's that predictive analytic, but it's not just on the phone system. It's patient communication, automating compliance monitoring, automating claims denial management reports, automating inventory management and its reports. And the list can go on. We also have telemedicine coordinators. They manage the remote healthcare services, making sure that the physician or the care team is comfortable with the PC on how to log in, what the steps are, and then also communicating to the, to the patient on how to log in to the system. There's digital health managers. They oversee the integration of digital technology. Anything digital that relates to the patient, that's what the digital health manager is responsible for. Then we have the population health manager. They work on strategies to improve the health outcome of a specific population or a community. For example, they may be developing a health information campaign, such as healthy heart diabetes awareness. You know, they may also be collecting and analyzing data for health demographics to identify risk factors or trends that are happening in that community. They also collaborate very closely with the healthcare providers to ensure the delivery of the coordination and integrated care of a certain population. And they always negotiate, in most cases, the contracts for payers and insurers. Then we have the sustainability manager. They're hired to reduce the hospital's environmental footprint. Their role is critical in that it spans from conducting environmental assessments to managing waste programs, to promoting energy conservation programs, and implementing water conservation initiatives in the hospital. So these roles, as I spoke briefly about them, reflect the future of health services management. And it's a future that some of you as students may be stepping into. So I'd like to move forward and uncover what opportunities and challenges that come about in each one of these roles. Next slide. So these emerging roles, they require unique skills, combining healthcare knowledge and technical expertise. So as I present them to you this afternoon, this is what I know of today and all the research that I've done, but it can be changing as I speak. And it can change with the hospital, the clinic, whatever agency you go to work for, those, these roles may change or be modified. But this is what I, I know today and have seen every day, is the health informatics specialist needs a strong understanding of healthcare and information technology and data analysis skills. When you think about the telemedicine coordinator, they have to be familiar with telemedicine technologies and have excellent organizational and communication skills. AI and machine learning specialists require a solid foundation in computer science, statistics, and machine learning, as well as the working knowledge of healthcare systems and processes. Now, some other roles for a couple of physicians I've, I've mentioned earlier, the next slide please, are digital health manager, which have technical proficiency, strong data analytic skills. They enjoy project management as well as have good written and verbal communication skills. This individual should be open to continual learning. We have the population health manager, which plays a critical role, as I mentioned earlier, in the healthcare setting. They're focusing on improving health outcomes and reducing health disparities within a specific population in the community. 
here are some of the key skills and talents that are required for this particular position. The ability to collect and analyze and interpret data, to identify trends, health risk in areas that need improvement. They should also have an understanding of healthcare delivery systems, the health policy, the health insurance, regulatory environment, as well as public health and social determinants of health. Skills in developing and implementing and evaluating population programs and initiatives is imperative. These include setting goals, planning, monitoring pro progress, and making the necessary adjustments. Strong written and verbal communication skills are very much needed, and they're essential for collaborating with the various stakeholders, including the healthcare providers, the patients, any stakeholders, community organizations, and policymakers. So having an understanding of the healthcare financing, budgeting, and resource allocation to ensure programs are cost-effective and sustainable is also a key factor for this person. When we talk about the sustainability manager in a hospital setting, it's a big word, but this individual plays a critical role in implementing and overseeing the sustainability initiatives that are aimed at reducing the environmental impact of an organization. So based on various sources, some of the key skills and the talents that are required for this position are the ability to analyze data and to understand the complex systems, to identify areas as well of improvement and also the effectiveness of a sustainability initiative. What does all that mean? You're managing the projects specific to the environment in the hospital itself. It includes the planning, the execution, and in monitoring. This includes understanding sustainable practices like waste management, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. Also having the ability to think big picture, to set strategic st sustainability goals and prioritize those initiatives based on potential impact is very crucial. I'm gonna take a break now for some water. So we go on to the next slide talked about all these different positions and the roles and what's expected. So where, where do you find these jobs? Where do you go? So the health, just know that the healthcare industry, as I keep saying, it's the fastest growing sector driven by an aging population and advancements in medical technology. And as such, job prospects in health service management are very favorable. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, employment of medical and health service managers is projected to grow 32% from 2020 to 2030, much faster than the average for all occupations. So when it comes to the actual career growth in health services management, health service management offers a wide range of career paths. And we've talked briefly about them. From entry-level positions, the top executive roles. With experience and additional education and certification, health services managers can progress to senior roles like chief executive officer, chief operations officer, and even a director of healthcare services. They may also specialize in areas like health informatics, quality imp improvement, or healthcare policy opening up further opportunities for advancement. Next slide. Some of the states that have the highest employment level you'll see are California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Massachusetts. And if we break it down even further, taking a look at the next slide, we look at the cities, the highest employment level are in New York, Newark, New Jersey, LA, Boston, DFW, Chicago, Washington, DC, Alexandria, Houston, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Philadelphia, Wellington, San Francisco, and Oakland. 
Next slide, please. So aspiring health services managers really should consider taking courses in health care administration, health informatics, business management, and public health when preparing for a career in health services management. Don't change what you're doing now at South Texas College. They've worked out your curriculum and you're taking the right courses. Also, additional courses that some people consider is law and ethics, economics, and home, excuse me, human resources. They've also found those courses beneficial. One should actually consider internships that can provide valuable hands-on experience and that can you can actually apply your classroom studies to real world situations. So should you decide that you want to get a job over the holiday or you you want a job while you're going to college or you want a job, you know, in the summertime, think about an internship because they do exist in the hospitals and clinics in health insurance companies and government agencies. And when you think about that internship, think about what are those health service management roles that are there? Next slide, please. In addition to the coursework and the internship, begin if you haven't already to network. And this is for anybody who's taking any of the courses here at South Texas. Networking can actually open the door to job opportunities and it can provide insight about the industry. Really consider attending industry conferences if you can. Participate in online forums and seek mentorship opportunities. Stay in touch with your professors and your classmates as they attend or they may be even attending some of these conferences, or they may be actually lecturing at some of these conferences. So it's always good to stay in touch with them. And after you've completed your coursework or you're close to graduating, you should possibly consider joining one of these organizations because again, this will actually help with that networking and help you stay abreast of what's happening in the industry. Now, the American College of Health Executive, Healthcare Executives and the Healthcare Information System, they can provide so much. I mean, I learned so much from being there, um, so many resources, and I learn about like what's happening in the industry every day. Every time I go to these meetings, there's always something changing. These organizations, they actually offer conferences. They have training sessions and programs, and the student membership is uh, I think for ACHE, I think it's like $75 and you can get it in three installments, you know, pay the 75 in three installments. And then HEMS is membership for students is $30. Now your, your college may actually have a free membership to, you know, that offers you, but that's just something for you to think about. I'm not saying you need to go out and do it, but that's something to think about as you advance into, you know, your senior year and you're thinking about what am I going to do, um, you know, you progress on to the field. Next slide. So in conclusion, I'd like you to really just realize that the field of health services management, it's experiencing an exciting phase of transformation. And as you know, we've talked about very high level today, the, the journey from key historical milestones to uh, current technological advancement, it provides a rich tapestry of progress and innovation. So as students in the medical and health services management program, the opportunities that lie ahead for you, they're immense. And you are the future leader. You're going to navigate into this ever evolving landscape. You're gonna be at the forefront right now of implementing new technologies, improving patient care, and making impactful decisions that shape the health services industry. So remember that change is not just about adapting, it's about innovating and leading. So embrace the changing aspects of health services management with curiosity and with resilience and use them as stepping stones 
to build a rewarding career in a dynamic field. Thank you so much for your attention and engagement. And I open the floor up for questions. Okay. So we do have a couple questions in the chat um, from Dr. St. Pierre. Uh, how can students balance the ethical considerations of cost effectiveness with the delivery of high quality patient care in health services management? Oh, that's a great test question. <laughs> so um, in balancing that, I would, um, from, from my experience, it's, it's, you're not, you're not by yourself. It takes a village. Okay. And to balance all of that with the education that you're getting, with your coursework, and then the training and the certification that you get, always refer back to that. Don't ever make any assumptions that are related to ethics, law, and balancing all that. But remember, you have the, you have the regulations, you have the compliance. And as I mentioned, it takes a village. So you may be managing a staff, but you'll have colleagues throughout the hospital that you can um, ask and, you know, how would you handle this? Here's, here's what's happening. Here's what the law is. This is what we're going to do. Okay, thank you so much. Another question from Dr. St. Pierre. As healthcare delivery models evolve, what strategies can health services managers employ to enhance interdisciplinary collaboration among healthcare professionals? All right, I want you to know that he's asking you some really good test questions here. <laughs> Pay attention, everyone. <laughs> That's right. So um, some strategies are the first and foremost, and it's it's about building um, it's it's building a plan. Okay, first you have to under you have to know of what's going on in your hospital and the clinic. What are the what your what your budget is? Very important to know that. And what is it that the hospital does well, and what is it? What are the, some of the challenges that they face? Okay, in building that. Again, and I'll keep saying it, it takes a village. And what I've seen is there's usually a committee that puts it together that's in, um, that develops that strategic plan. And the health services manager may lead that project in putting together that strategic plan. But there's every, every different, every department is involved in that planning and, and contributing to that strategic plan. So you want to define first and foremost, what the goal is, okay? Obviously, we have a 2004 to 2025 goal, and we we have our but this budget, and I'll just make this, I'm making this up, let's say our, our focus is, from our research, we found that we have high incidence of high blood pressure and high incidence of diabetes in our community. So with that being said, what are some programs that we want to put together? And how can we do that and engage the community um, in this, as well as um, improve patient care, as well as reduce diabetes and um, high blood pressure. And so you take all of that into consideration. You work with the community um, leaders. Um, you should, you'll notice that most hospitals are obviously in, you know, in smack dab in the community. The mayor's involved in that. So there's a lot of things that go into that planning. And, you know, I said to find the goal, you set the objectives, timeline is important, the budget, and take the village, follow the steps, and use that plan as a roadmap. Does that answer your question? I, I, I hope it does. Unfortunately, I do not know much about it, but um, I'll, uh, I will let you know if uh, Dr. St. Pierre confirms in the chat. Yes, he said, thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a question from a student. What do you believe are the best certifications to obtain a better opportunity to receive a job as a healthcare manager? Well, uh, I would say, again, it's, I'm, I'm always going to say it takes a village. So first and foremost, um, you want to make sure that you're getting 
all the certifications that you possibly that your that South College South Texas College offers that you can get free. Um, take them. Okay. Um, the best certifications for that would be, um, you know, we talked a little bit about um, getting a law. I don't want you to go get a law degree, but if there's classes that you can take um, that are free online on um, law and ethics, you really want to become very, very comfortable um, with knowing the ethical guidelines as a whole, hospital ethical got healthcare, excuse me, ethical guidelines. And then um, as you progress in your career um, and with the, uh, there's, there will be advancements and in, in changes in the law. I will promise you that. So um, be very comfortable and be and very knowledgeable and flexible in adapting to those changes. Um, and then to go back to your question on the certification, um, you know, I think it's important to um, get that human resource piece of it because you will be managing people. You will be working very closely with people. So if there's an opportunity for you to have any type of a human resource or, or um, managing certification, you can. You should, you should consider that. Okay, thank you so much. Another question from Dr. St. Pierre. So pay attention, everyone. <laughs> Considering the current emphasis on preventative care, how can health services managers contribute to the promotion of public health initiatives within healthcare or organizations? Okay, great question. So um, if you just kind of... Um, I know you're in school and so your focus is all in school, but if you take time over the next few days, um, turn on television um, or look at your, you know, when you're out looking at your phone, listen to what ho what hospital, what hospital events are going on, okay? Um, like right now there's gonna be the big toy drive, but around the toy drive, there may be something else going on. Um, uh, the month of November may be Cardiac Awareness Month, okay? So every month, every quarter, hospitals have some type of a promotion going on as it relates to improving healthcare, whether it's um, cardiovascular, um, whether it's respiratory, whether it's uh, women's well health, children's well health, cancer awareness, um, breast aware breast cancer awareness, all of that. So when you're putting together your strategy as a health services management, again, you're going to have research that you've done. So you're going to go out um, and either um, employ a research company to help with that, or you may actually have a research department. Most hospitals have a research department, or they um, go out and they, they'll collect that research and they'll bring it to you. And so you'll have to look at from um, the research that's been provided to you, what's the highest incidence of, of a health-related case that you're seeing out there in the community. And then based on that, that's how you can put together your plan. So let's say the, the highest incident is um, heart, um, you know, high blood pressure, okay? So for December, we're gonna focus on high blood pressure and put together a promotion for that, okay? And then in January, it's gonna be breast cancer awareness. And remember now, there's also months, um, you know, like October is breast cancer awareness month, so you wanna kind of chime in with that. So January I may not do that. January I may, um, you know, I may, think I may say, you know what, we're going to do respiratory awareness. So any type of lung nodule um, uh, treatment or uh, diagnosis treatment that we can provide, let's let's look at that. And then in February, since it's Valentine's Day, it's cardiac awareness month is heart health, right? So those are some things that you want to think about as you plan that um, promotion for health care, health awareness, excuse me. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I haven't seen any more show up in the chat, but feel free to uh, put them in there. Um, 
there we go. Dr. Uh, Dr. St. Pierre had one on deck. Um, in the context of evolving healthcare policies, what changes and opportunities do you anticipate for aspiring health services managers? So changes that I see um, definitely occurring would be, first and foremost, is insurance. You know, we talked about Obamacare, and that's ever evolving. Um, because we're offering, you know, free health care or, or health care for everybody, right? Um, we're going to see that change as far as not not so much what what's provided, but um, it's going to grow. I think it's going to grow. You know, so everything we have an aging population, and so with that aging population, there are conditions that scientists are finding, doctors are finding that hey, we can treat, and this may prolong the life of this individual. So we may have to adjust that as far as um, the payers. So how? So what does that look like? So I, I think you know, as I said, to be you know flexible and to be resilient is always expect every year that insurance uh, is going to change. And it, I think with Obamacare, um, ACA, it's going to increase as much. Medicaid, Medicare. If you watch television, it's all these commercials on there. Most of you don't have to worry about that, but it's changing, right? So it's it's evolving. I think that's the big one of the biggest things. The other thing is um, patients' rights. Um, while we have ACA, it's always about patients' rights, you know. And that's not, the nice thing about ACA is it brought to the forefront patients' rights that everybody should be treated fairly and should have the same same treatment to be offered amount the same amount of treatment and not be denied that so we have i think you'll see that um, evolving as well all right thank you so much do you have another one on deck uh dr st pierre <laughs> he does uh what advice do you have for students aiming to contribute to diversity equity and inclusion initiatives within healthcare organizations as future health services managers excellent question um you know health service managers the key word is managers right so Remember this role, it's evolving and you're not going to just stay as a health informatics specialist. You are going to become, I see it. Some of you are going to be CEOs. Some of you are going to be COOs and some of you are going to be directors. But I see most of you may be being CEOs. With that, you look at your class, everybody's different, okay? You've seen that growing up. You see that from the world. You learn so much from people who are not like you. There's so much that people bring to the table. So in, where I'm getting at at that is it's important to accept change, to accept diversity, bring people in who aren't like you, who may not think like you, because you learn so much from them. And they will learn so much from you as well. So how do you do that? During the interviewing process. Take some time to really get to know that person that you're interviewing. Learn more about them, where they're from, where they what, what excites them. Okay. Um, look at your look at the department. How does my department look? Is it all women? Is it all men? Now I'm I'm also going to say, um, in doing that, you want to hire the best person for that, but also the person who is open to learn. Okay, so the other person may not have that many, may not have the highest skills available, or or not be showing those skills, but they're willing to learn, and they're and they're they're engaged, and they want to, you know. They want to learn, and they they want to be the um, they want to be the population manager. Think about it. Interview them, talk to them, and I would say, 
it's important for all of us because this is the world we live in. Everybody's different. And it's important to bring not only the best skills, but bring in diversity, inclusion. And when I say that, it's not just, um, you know, the color of our skin. It's, um, you know, hearing impaired, visually impaired as well. Okay, because we have all this technology, remember I've been talking to you about, that um, is, it's just amazing um, that everybody in the workplace, anybody who wants to work, who wants to contribute to the health and the welfare of a patient, there's a place for them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, another one from Dr. St. Pierre. Uh, in what ways can students proactively prepare for leadership roles in health services management during their undergraduate studies? Oh, well, this is a great question. First and foremost, um, I would say um, go find out what opportunities are there in, in the college there for, for students in the leadership role. You know, do you have a student union? You have a student group? Um, is there a diversity group there? Become, you know, consider becoming um, either the president, the secretary, whatever, but take take a take a leadership role in it. If you feel like that's a big jump, you take baby steps. At least become a member of of the organization, right? And then um, volunteer and but set set some achievable goals. Don't just be volunteering for like three months. Volunteer for three months and then say, I'd like to, I'd like to be the secretary. I'd like to be the vice president. Okay. Also, talk to, you know, talk to your professors. They don't bite. They're people. Believe me, they sat where you are today. Okay. Ask them, you know, what can I do? I'm looking for a leadership role where I am today as a student, I'd like to, um, to take on more of a leadership role. What can I do? How, how can I help you in your class? You know, um, Heather, reach out to Heather. She may need somebody to help her with, uh, you know, the next webinar that occurs. You may take on this leadership role to be um, the moderator, okay? I'm always looking for for students right. to work with and everything. So, yeah. yeah, no, definitely reach out to me. I'll even put my my email in the chat for you guys. Yeah. Um, this one isn't a question, but is a compliment. Uh, yeah. I love the feedback you're giving. It's good to hear that support is needed within organizations to prepare us for what healthcare can be in the future. I'm really enjoying this. Good. Thank you. I'm glad you are. Like you are. We're always happy to uh, get feedback from you guys. Um, and that's another thing that you can also send to my email if you would like to. There we go. So, yeah, if you do, if you want to do something with the library, you want to be involved in something like this, let me know. Right. <laughs> oh, I, thought, I forgot one other thing because I did this in college is, um, you know, I talked about the American College of Healthcare Executives and HIMSS. So in each one of those organizations, um, it may, you may have a local chapter there. Um, and so as you can even reach out to them, to that local chapter and ask to be a volunteer. And then um, as you begin to volunteer through that, you can take more of a, of a student leadership role because you'll find that both of these organizations are, I mean, they will, they embrace students. In fact, they'll say, hey, our next meeting is, um, you know, December 7th, and we need somebody to help with registration. All you have to do is, like, stand at the table and check people off. Can you help with that? You know, you may think, oh, that's kind of crazy. But I'm telling you, that helps. That's, that's your, your first step, the baby step, into the leadership role and getting out um, to see people. And network, network, network. You know, whether you're in health services management or not, it's important to network. Yes. And I know that um, 
I'm not speaking from uh, health services because I have not gone to any of those uh, uh, conferences, but I have gone to plenty of uh, library conferences, and I know that uh, they are very happy to uh, help students get in. There's usually a student rate for uh, events like that. But the other thing is that if you volunteer, a lot of times they will just give you your pass for free. Yeah, get it And free. then you spend so many hours at a registration desk, handing out badges, maybe directing people around to where the vendor hall is, things like that. And then the rest of the weekend you get to spend at this wonderful conference that otherwise would be uh, uh, financially prohibitive. So, you know, I did that a couple times while I was in uh, my uh, grad school program for uh, my library masters. So, you know, that is, that's a, that's a great way to do things too. Uh, we're always looking and, feel free to reach out to the library too. We do have, we don't tend to use a lot of volunteer work um, at the library, but um, there's almost always something that we can uh, refer you to. Um, we'll have events coming up. We network with a whole bunch of the different uh, um, uh, departments at the college, and we can let you know about all the different fun things that are that are going on that you could hop in and, and volunteer at and take a leadership role in. You know, like, uh, Dr. McCoy says it takes a village and, you know, whatever your special interest is could be something that you wind up applying uh, on your in your uh, health management field because there's just so much that's involved. Yeah. So. Absolutely. All right. So we are uh, close to three o'clock. Um, so I want to honor everyone's time and uh, thank you guys uh, all for coming to this uh, webinar. Um, if you would uh, be so kind as to fill out the uh, feedback survey you're going to be getting in your email within the next 24 hours or so, uh, I would really appreciate that. Basically, we take the information that you guys give us and the feedback that we get, and we are then uh, able to offer more events like this and bring more uh, wonderful established speakers like Dr. McCoy here to speak to you guys. So thank you very much again, uh, everyone, for uh, coming today. Thank you, Dr. St. Pierre, for reaching out to the library and working with us. And thank you again, Dr. McCoy. And I hope things get sunnier for you in Dallas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll try and send some sunshine your way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank so, you guys so much for taking time for your afternoon. I really do appreciate it. And, um, you know, enjoyed being here. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a safe and wonderful uh, holiday next week. Yeah. Thank you again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.